Welcome to Health Matters with Dr. Nelson Bulmash as he takes a fresh look at today's most interesting health topics with functional medicine's leading doctors and experts. Learn how to feed your mind, exercise your body, and nurture your spirit in the way nature intended. Catch him live every other Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Over the next hour, we'll introduce you to some fascinating people and engaging discussions that may provide you with answers to assist in revolutionizing your own personal health. And now, here's Dr. Nelson. Hey, everybody. Dr. Nelson Bulmash here, the host of Health Matters on the UI Media Network. It's fantastic to be with you here in a matter of days. I will be 60 years old, and I only say that to you because it it seems old to me. I don't know where my life went. I remember when my dad was 75, we had a family uh, gathering, a very small one, and he was not big. It was very, at the end of his life in particular, he was very reclusive. I mean, in general, he was an introvert. He could express as an extrovert, but generally was very introverted and didn't want much to do to be made about his 75th birthday. And it was amazing to be with him. He was the most impressive man I ever knew in so many ways. He was a man that uh, lived his life in a a very interesting, self-expressed way. He was extraordinarily brilliant. First man in the world to solve certain health issues that nobody else had resolved. And because of his brilliance, there were probably thousands to tens of thousands of people who were alive today. And uh, he was just remarkably astute in math and science, though Anyone who knew him knew that he was brilliant in literature as well. He was a man who could recite any and all of the Shakespearean plays in multiple languages. And I've never met anyone in my life who could do that and was yet brilliant in calculus, chemistry, physics, math, just just incredible. And he had the ability to take highly complex ideas and make them very simple. And I hope to do just that today because we're going to be talking about biochemistry and hormones so we're going to add in some basic biochemistry, we're going to add in some basic endocrinology. And listen, don't worry, don't sweat this. It will not be complicated. I'm going to make it very easy. And here's a cool thing. I'm not even going to give you a quiz. I don't think, but I might, just to make sure you're paying attention to me. So if you're doing other things, like making dinner, you better be paying attention while you're, while you're listening to me, okay? Because I might just give you a quiz. <laughs> Anyhow, we'll get started here. So... One of the questions that I'm asked over and over again, and I know some of you say to me, now, what, what are some of the things that people ask you frequently? Today's show is what people ask me more frequently than any other question. And it is simply this, Nelson, is there a way in the myriad, the plethora of different diets that I can at least maintain my muscle mass and lose fat? And the truth is, there very much is. Very, very, very much is. Now, the tough thing is I'm not going to be able to go through everything that you want to hear today. I may, as a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you straight up right now, I have so much material to cover. I may even have to do a second show because I'm not going to be able to give you everything. But I am going to, I found a book, and it's a little dated, but most of the information by far, probably 98% of the information is still very, very accurate. And it's called Macrobolic priming your body to build muscle and burn fat nutrition. And this book, I believe, came out in either 2002 or 2003, and it really is an amazing book. Because here's the thing. There are many ways to eat, some of which I applaud more than others. Most of you know I'm not really a big fan of veganism. I tried veganism personally at least four times. I failed miserably. I ended up getting sick off, and I got depressed. I lost so much body mass that I started having family members and friends pull me over and say, Nelson, we got to talk. What in the world's going on with you? You were a really stout, ripped, 245, 260-pound man. You look like you're dying of AIDS or cancer. I lost so much body mass, and I felt so awful about myself and life. I just never had energy. I never felt full. I never felt nourished. And I'm not, look, I'm not trying to diss vegans. If you're a vegan and you're thriving, that's all I care about. I will tell you this, I get a huge, not anymore, because most people know I just, I don't, I'm not interested in treating vegans. I'm, it's not, it's not a way that I think is appropriate to feed most people. I, it's just a, a way that I fundamentally disagree for a lot of reasons. I'm not here to go into that. But I am going to go into it to the extent that you realize that you have veganism on this side and carnivore on this side. And look, if you want to be a vegan for a short while to detox, might be a good idea. Uh, Although most people in one to three years 
come to me crying or, or very disheveled and, and uh, unhappy, not looking good. Their eyes are gaunt. They look skinny. Their tissue looks mushy to me. Uh, they're complaining that they can't think. They can't concentrate. Their memory is poor. They have no energy. They've lost lots of muscle mass. Because somewhere in that conversation that we call veganism, there's this notion that you need very little protein. I've even had doctors come up to me and say, all you need, Nelson, is a handful of almonds. It's a myth that you need a lot of protein. There is no myth about it. I have coached world-class athletes. I have coached people to world titles, world records. When I tell you protein is one of the most fundamentally important macromolecules you can put in your body, I'm not kidding you. And I'm a fan of higher protein than lower protein. Now, I had a guest on recently, uh, Lisa Everett. She's brilliant. And she is beginning to really disagree that you can't get good, clean mammals, right? Uh, whether it be venison, whether it be bear, bison, deer, you know, I don't know if you eat possum or squirrel. I actually have had some people come in and do. The problem is that, that we're at an unprecedented level of pollution in our world. And so everything, by the way, including, and nobody talks about this, but including the vegetation, right? Because where do all the toxins in our jet stream fall to? The ground. And then they're absorbed by what? By everything. If you're a plant, you're absorbing them through the soil, if you're an animal who eats the plant, you're concentrating the poisons. And so I get, I get the sense of this. I get the uh, understanding of it that, that you're going to concentrate more pollution in the animal since the animal eats plants than the plant itself. I get that. And yet I find, and I find myself in this category, I do not thrive on a low-protein diet. And I have tried eating tons and tons of supplemented pea protein and brown rice protein, and it just doesn't work the same for me. If it does for you, good. But I'm also a big fan of eating real meals. I know people who eat, you know, four or five protein bars a day, and they think that's healthy. I know people who have shakes. Shakes are good as supplemental meals. You'll hear me today talk about supplemental meals. I'm a big, big fan of eating three or four real meals. That means that, for example, you have some kind of an animal source it might be a salmon fillet, shrimp, scallops, turkey, chicken. Some people, if you're eating an ostrich, if you're in Africa, you get the idea. You know, in other words, you have some kind of plant matter and it varies greatly. Look, if you're somebody who's inactive, you do a lot of sitting and looking at a computer or you're on a, your couch potato. I, I know more and more people who retired during the pandemic and I ask them what they do and they tell me they watch TV 12 or 14 hours a day. Wow. I'm not designed for that, and I hope they're not really designed for that either, because I believe that life is meant to be lived in a way that you're always, you're, you're somehow fulfilling on some purpose. If, if you're retiring from the job that you're tired of, I get it, but find something, you know, volunteer, do something that gives you purpose, because there's nothing mentally, physically, or spiritually sound about endlessly watching 12 to 14, 16 hours of TV a day. There is nothing. Some of these people are becoming alcoholics because they start drinking at 10 in the morning when they start watching their shows. And uh, it's, just, it's just not a healthy way to live. You know, there's so, there's so much more to do than to live in front of a computer playing computer games or to watch Netflix series after Netflix series. It's just not healthy. So please don't do that. If you want to retire early, if you're depressed or anxious about the things that have gone down in the last years, I got it. The world is kind of a crazy place right now. I understand. It seems like we're going from one crazy to another crazy. And uh, who knows? Maybe some of it is orchestrated, maybe not, subject for a different day. But the idea is that you want to have a, you want to eat in a form that's very balanced. And what I like about the macrobolic nutrition paradigm that I'm going to share with you today is it's really balanced. Here's the idea. The fundamental premise is that you're going to eat 45% of your nutrients as carbohydrates, 45%. So not quite 50%. The Olympic committee some years ago determined that to maximize functional performance, energy production, you had to get at least 42% of your calories from nutrition. Now, every time I screw this up and I go a little more keto or a little bit more carnivore, I get to the gym and I die early on in my workout because I don't have energy. And so this is an interesting topic for me. And the reason I'm doing this show is because I have certain friends very close to me 
who said, Nelson, you got to help me with the diet. I mean, I'm either I'm gaining muscle and I'm gaining fat or I'm losing muscle and losing fat. So I'm going to make this as easy to understand today as possible. Now, bear with me because there's a huge amount of information to give. You know, I can throw this out at you and you're going to have difficulty if, if I'm not careful with you implementing it. So listen, here's your resource. Again, I'm going to show this a few more times for people who are coming in late. Macro, macrobolic nutrition here, right? Uh, by Gerard Dent and Kevin Hopkins, the very buff gentleman, a bodybuilder of many, many years, very sharp guy. And Kevin is a pharmacist who really knows about chemistry. So I mentioned 45% carbohydrate intake, 35% of your diet should be a protein, and then 20% is fat. All of these and these ratios are very, very important. Carbs give you energy that's easy to use. Now, I know that my ketogenic colleagues say, Nelson, carbs actually don't burn cleanly like burning of fats in the ketogenic format. I get that. And here's the problem I have. And I'm, once again, I'm not saying a ketogenic diet is bad. I've seen brilliant things. I've seen people who are no longer diabetic, their heart attack risk, their cancer risk, their chronic degenerative disease risk, uh, kidney stress, all of all of them go down precipitously. I think it's a remarkable way to to live and to eat. The challenge I have is when I was doing ketogenic for a prolonged period of time, I had no gas at all when I was in the gym to work out. I remember one day feeling like I'm just going to crush this thing and eight warm-up sets into my workout, I had no energy and I thought, this is ridiculous, I, I've got no gas here. And I had to get some carbs and I, I, I didn't get them in my system enough to get my blood sugar raised enough that I felt good, it ruined my workout. And that was the moment I said, I'm not going ketogenic. I'll use some of their principles, but I want to work out hard. And to work out hard, we're going to stick to this. And this is my paradigm using macrobolic nutrition, where once again, I'm going to say this many times because I want you to hear this. And because some of the times you're going to have to just, that you're maybe at a restaurant, you're at a friend's, you're going to have to do the best you can to estimate the carbs involved with whatever you're consuming. 45 is a magic number for carbohydrates and 35 for proteins and 20% fat. Now, here's the thing. It, this is also beautifully constructed because what happens with this ratio, this equation, is it fosters having lots of energy for your workouts. And I'm somebody who works out intensely. A whole lot of people that I know will tell me they work out, and when I watch them, they don't work out hard. It's a very laissez-faire kind of... I'm in, and they're all machines. I'm not dissing machines, but the thing is, a machine workout is not the same as a free weight workout. Free weight, you're stabilizing the weight in time and space, and so you're fighting gravity right in all axes. If I'm bench pressing 500 pounds, I'm stabilizing it X, Y, and Z axes, right? If I'm pushing it on a machine, I can push it with my foot, I can push it with my elbow, I can push it with my hand. It's going to follow a pre-programmed line of drive. Therefore, I do not have to worry about the gravitational force on the apparatus dropping the weight if I lose control. I can only push the handle, as an example, in one direction. Only one direction. So the coefficient for stress on the nervous system and the musculoskeletal system is dramatically less. You've heard me talk about the neuromuscular activation coefficient. It's a reflection of how, how dramatically an exercise stimulates the nervous system, musculoskeletal system, and the nervous system. We're going to talk more about this when I get back. We're going to take my first commercial break, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my sponsors, and we'll continue this conversation. Safety Air Purification Systems, an air purifier with robust technologies that can filter, sterilize, and re-energize large quantities of air at a whisper quiet volume. It features a proprietary HEPA RX and pre-filter that act as a capturing layer going for big particles and ultra-fine particles. Its next layer is an activated carbon filter that absorbs and captures volatile organic compounds and noxious odors. From viruses to bacteria, its kill chamber packs a three-punch layer to destroy over 99% of anything that remains in the air. 
and while most air purifiers stop at the capture or kill stage, Safety Air Purifier takes it one step further, re-energizing clean, pure, sterilized air by creating negative ions within the revitalizing chamber. The Safety Air Purifier also monitors air quality in real time, utilizing smart sensor technology that helps you breathe better air, increase productivity, and improve morale. But don't just take our word for it. Ask the thousands of workplaces we've helped. Fortune 500 companies, dental offices, senior facilities, K-12 schools and universities, and professional sports teams. The Safety Air Purifier's robust technology combined to protect you against indoor air pollutants and viruses to make the most powerful yet quietest air purifier. Safety Air Purification. All right, I'm back. I'm Dr. Nelson Bullmesh. Thank you for joining me today. I'm, I'm just stunned. I feel like life is going so, so incredibly fast. I spoke about that a moment ago when we were celebrating my dad's 75th birthday. And I remember he said to me, son, I hope you really like your life because I blinked and 50 years went by. He said, you were born almost to the day that I defended my PhD dissertation. And 50 years went by and I just... I just don't know how that happened. And less than three years later, he was gone. He was taken from our world. And it's, um, it's a sad thing when somebody so extraordinary goes. They leave a chasm in your heart and your mind that seems to stay void, never to be filled. So uh, please love and care for the people around you because one day they won't be there. And I don't mean to be morose. I just want you to really love and cherish those that you're with. Okay, so we're going to go into this now. We're going to talk about a variety of hormones that are critical in this equation and that we need to balance. And we have insulin, glucagon, growth hormone, and cortisol. And we're going to talk about how this 45, 35, 20 ratio stabilizes those. And I want to talk also about how some of the others don't do a great job of it. Now, once again, I'm not saying that there aren't people that won't do brilliantly. I have a friend who, of all things, was a vegan. And used to lecture everybody about the importance of being a vegan. And all of a sudden, one day, she looked in the mirror and said, I don't look good. I look mushy, puffy. I'm weak. And I don't like the way I feel after some years of being a vegan. Of all things, she did a 180-degree about face and went into the, the carnivore, carnivore system and is thriving. Looks absolutely like a supermodel again, which, I mean, I don't know if she was a supermodel. She was a model. Very striking features. A brilliant woman really uh, doing pioneering work in brain recovery, in the brain recovery field. <laughs> I just look at her and I think, you're amazing. And she just feels and looks incredible. Who would, go, who would know? You know, somebody would go from veganism to carnivore, right? So here's the thing. I want to jump in and I want to talk specifically to those who are exercising because I believe we should all be exercising. And the key is this. When you work out... If you work out particularly intensely, if you don't, to a lesser degree, what happens? What happens is as you go through your workout, your energy level goes down. And of course, if you're working out hard, it goes down dramatically. When that happens, you open up the gates, if you will, for a number of things to happen. When your amino acids get low, your blood sugar levels get low, your insulin drops, the body produces a hormone called glucagon. Also, like insulin, it is produced in the alpha cells of the pancreas. Glucagon causes the release of fatty acids, mostly from fats like triglycerides. So bear with me here. You may have to listen to this two or three times, but it's, it's, worth, it's worth listening to multiple times so you understand it. If you eat too much sugar, which... Most people, quite frankly, do in the United States. You become pre-diabetic and then eventually become diabetic. You become what's called a type 2 diabetic. And so what happens is you get too much blood, sugar, elevated chronically in your system. And when that happens, you lose sensitivity of the insulin receptor sites on the cell membranes. And as that happens, you accumulate a very dangerous fat when it's too high called triglycerides made of glycerol and three fatty acids. And so this, as we know, is a big indicator for heart attack risk and stroke 
We also know that when you're diabetic or pre-diabetic, it's something that you follow because it's indicative of the likelihood that you'll develop diabetes. And diabetes might be the single most destructive disease on the planet, unless you're you know, being consumed by something like a flesh-eating bacterial infection, because it kills you slowly over time, and it destroys every tissue and every part of your body over time. It leaves you with a heart that doesn't work, with kidneys and a liver that doesn't work, with a greatly elevated risk for dementia. And so we don't want to ever eat dietarily a diet that's high in sugar because sugar is extremely destructive. And you've heard me talk about that many, many times. And so one of the problems with my vegan colleagues is they eat way too much. Did you say sugar? Way too much much sugar. And I want to tell you about a quick study that we did. I have a very, very dear friend of mine, really, really sharp, uh, raw foodist, a raw food chef. I mean, certified as a a raw food chef. And she was a vegan for years. And I watched her lose a tremendous amount of muscle. She was very athletic, very, very beautiful woman. And I said to her one day, what are you going to do with the plight of obesity in your practice. And she looked at me and said, what are you talking about? I said, every woman I see going in to see you has an obesity issue. She said, they're all skinny. I said, correction, they're all skinny fat. She said, what are you, Nelson, what are you talking about? I said, figure out a way that works for you, whether it's calipers, whether it's water immersion, whether it's bioimpedance, to determine the fat percentage of those women Basically, 90, probably 5% of her patients were women, and most of them were vegan. She specialized in that. And I said, listen carefully to me, please. I'm not being funny. I'm not trying to be cruel. You have an epidemic of obesity in your practice. And she said, I'll look into it, but this is absurd. All my women are very thin. I said, please, humor me. Do your due diligence. She was shocked. She came to me weeks later and said, Nelson, I don't, how did you know that? I said, it's obvious. Look how mushy their skin is, their tissues. She said, do you know what I found? I said, yeah, you probably found that women that were vegans for probably 8, 10 to 20 years ranged in body fat from at least 40, maybe up to 60%. She said, that's exactly what I found. I said, I don't understand why you're shocked. If you don't get enough protein, what does your body do? What your body does is it takes on a low-protein diet through a process called gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis. It takes protein from your muscles and converts it, breaks it down into amino acids. And then those amino acids are taken to the liver and they're turned into glucose. Now, there are a whole lot of problems with this. One is, if you're not somebody who works out, particularly works out hard and you, you, don't, you don't have a stockpile of muscle, eventually you're going to have serious protein acquisition problems, meaning you're going to run out of muscle to cannibalize. And so she was absolutely shocked and realized that this concept of low protein for her vegan patients wasn't working at all because they were all technically obese. They, had, they averaged 40 to 60% body fat, and she had some who were vegans for 25 years that, were, that had a percentage higher than 60 for body fat percentage, very, very unhealthy, as you can imagine. So it was so shocking to her that she said, this isn't the right road. And now she's eating as the basis. She's, she's not carnivore, but she eats a lot of animal protein and a lot of raw vegetables. And she's feeling better than she has in many, many years. So the idea here is if you're on too much sugar, then your body is always going to attempt to use that sugar, Right? To produce energy. Now, eventually, too much sugar causes insulin resistance. The body just can't keep shuttling in enough sugar into the cells. And so the body converts it into triglycerides, a glycerol, backbone, attached to three fatty acids. Now, if you're eating a normal amount of sugar, that's not a problem. But it becomes a huge problem because, once again, it drives you towards diseases like diabetes, heart attack, strokes, increased risk of cancer, and so on and so forth. But it also makes you functionally weak. It makes your tissues mushy. 
week flat. Now, once again, not saying that there's not an expert out there that knows how to do this. I'm saying that most people I meet don't know how to do it. Now, you go to the other side with carnivore, you're getting plenty of protein and plenty of fat. The problem is, or one potential problem is, that you're not getting the energy you need through carbs, right? Because they don't eat a lot of sugar. I'm not saying you should eat a lot of sugar, but often the carnivore people I know don't eat enough carbohydrates to sustain them in the workouts at the level of intensity, for example, that I participate in. And so one of the downfalls of that is that the body will consume, in many cases, it'll cannibalize itself by taking the amino acids from the muscle, right? Muscles made of protein, and it'll strip the uh, protein from the muscles, and then it'll take those, again, it'll take those amino acids and it'll convert them through gluconeogenesis into... But what did I tell you? Come on, think about it. It'll convert it into glucose. So you have energy. So, and the problem with this too is from an aesthetics perspective, when you don't get enough carbs to form a lot of glycogen, you have really flat, much smaller muscle. Now, maybe you don't care about that. I like muscles to look full. So with a 45, 35, 20 perspective, you get plenty of good carbohydrates, And we're going to talk about what those carbohydrates look like in a second here. And when you do that, you have lots of energy to help you burn carbs and fat. You're going to burn both. And I'm going to talk about how you can do that. There's the trick. There's the trick. We're going to talk about that in just a second. So hold on. Bear that. I know some of you are going, wait a minute. Are you going to burn carbs, Nelson? Are you going to burn fat? You're going to burn both. I'm going to teach you how to do it. So what happens is let's look now at this 45, 35, 20 perspective and how it works. There's something called a glycemic index. The glycemic index takes a fasting person and gives them 50 grams of either a sugar or, or a carbohydrate. And it determines in said period of time how much elevation in blood sugar you get. Very, very, very important because we have three different categories here. And uh, what we're looking at here is we're looking at three different zones. You have the hypoglycemic. Oh, I can't seem to find it here. No worries. I memorized it. So you have the hyperglycemic mode. We'll start at the top, which means you're, you're consuming enough sugar that your blood sugar goes from 80 milligrams to over 120 milligrams. And the problem with this this type of eating is that it forces you down the path of diabetes, right? But it also increases the hormone insulin. It increases insulin, it lowers the hormone glucagon. Remember, insulin is produced in the body when the sugar rises. Insulin is the hormone that couples with glucose, and then is shuttled in, in, through the cell membrane. And if you don't eat too much, it works very well. And you've got to have cofactors like chromium. A lot of people don't get enough chromium because chromium is found in grains, and so many people aren't eating grains anymore that we have a lot of people who are deficient in chromium. So they need, need um, GTF, which is a, a, um, it's a chromium-based supplement that creates what's called glucose tolerance faster. So it allows you to create the insulin, the activated insulin complex that takes the sugar through the cell membrane and all is well. Your body can burn energy, though not as cleanly as the keto people will tell you, more uh, oxidants produced from it, but it works very effectively and it gives you very fast energy. That's what I love about it is you, you have energy that's right there right now. The ketogenic diet, I was very slow to produce energy and it didn't give me enough energy to train as intensely as I wanted. Now, when we get back, I'm going to go into the other two categories, and you're going to see which one you want to find yourself. We're going to take a commercial break. It's our second. I'm Dr. Nelson Bullmesh. You're listening to Health Matters, and we're talking about maximizing muscle acquisition and the oxidation or the burning of fat. If this content resonates with you, don't forget to subscribe to our channel at uimedianetwork.org to stay updated with our uncensored shows. Also, like and follow us at UI Media Network on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and almost all your favorite podcasting platforms. Most importantly, if you're being censored on social media, write to us at contact at uimedianetwork.org 
to get your message out. And remember, keep raising that frequency. Hey, we're back. In a moment, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to resume my talk about the glycemic index and what zone it puts you in and how important that is. But before we do, shout out to one of my sponsors, Ken, Dr. Ken Kasky, and he is he's an amazing man. We met, went to school over 30 years ago. Called me not long ago and said, Nelson, I think I have some technologies that you're going to be very, very interested in. And not only was I interested, he's taking care of me right now. And I mentioned in my last show how tremendous I feel with the technologies he's using. And I want to talk about one of them right off the bat, which is hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Uh, this is very, very important because one of the big problems that I see every day in my clinic with those who are particularly 40-ish up to 70, 80, and even 90 is poor circulation. And what we're looking at here when you go into a hyperbaric oxygen chamber is they can put you easily at what's called 15 PSI, which is a measurement of pressure that your body is under while you're breathing pure oxygen. So the hyperbaric oxygen work is remarkable for driving pure oxygen into all the cells of your body. So if you're somebody who's suffering from COVID brain, COVID heart, COVID lung, or COVID anything, quite frankly, kidneys, digestive system. I had COVID, I believe, five times. My last being January 1st when I believe I had Omicron. I had so many people around me who called me uh, late in December saying, Nelson, I'm sorry, we were very close for a prolonged period of time, and I've been diagnosed with Omicron. Right now, there's a new Omicron variant coming out uh, that's supposed to be, in, it's just starting here, we're supposed to have another wave. It's supposed to be very contagious, but not as lethal. So, boy, I don't know about you, but I'm a little tired of even hearing the word COVID. And quite frankly, I could not hear it again for the rest of my life, and I'd be happy. So the thing is, when you're putting pure oxygen under pressure, you're maximizing the delivery and the utilization of oxygen. And what it does for people, like I was astounded, and in three to five visits, I was breathing almost normally. I, I had an oxygen saturation rate of cruising, like I'd check it at work, and it was 82 to 86. And as you can imagine, I was always gasping. My patients would look at me and go, Nelson, are you okay? Because you don't seem to be breathing very well. Yeah, no, 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 I'm not, particularly not wearing a mask. So trying to wear a mask and breathe when your oxygen saturation is 82 to 86, not fun and not effective, and you get really severe headaches within a few hours. And so I worked for many, many months with near-migraine headaches from probably low oxygen delivery. Very happy we're not wearing masks, quite frankly, right now, for me at least. You make up your own mind if you want to wear one now or not. But here's the thing. You deliver more oxygen to your cells, it means greater cellular energy formation. And that is extremely powerful. And folks over at Advanced Recovery Therapy Center, are they're very, very fine and highly competent people. And they, they serve you through the best equipment there is. Their chambers are a quarter of a million dollars. They're the real deal. They're no offense to those of you who have the little zip-in ones where you're breathing compressed air. I, if people go in there and they have a severe mold problem, they can take them down to 27 PSI. That's the equivalent of being in a, in a state of uh, diving at 70-ish uh, feet. And once again, the key is you're breathing in with his systems pure oxygen, pure oxygen, for an hour. So you're in the chamber for 90 minutes because it takes you 10 to 15 minutes to get down to that pressure. And then once you've been there for an hour, they use another 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the amount of pressure on your system, to bring you back to surface pressure or tension. So it's tremendous at improving your health. I can't believe my brain function is better. I'm breathing much better. I have much better energy. My workouts are improving. Life is better. Check them out at Advanced Recovery Therapy, Dr. Ken Kasky. And Ken, thank you. Daniel, thank you for the great care you've given me. I'm very, very impressed. And I tell all of you, call them up. Get your appointments. They do hyperbaric work. They do cryo work. They do uh, laser work. And I mean the real deal. They have Erconia lasers. One of them is $50,000. It is unbelievable 
how it alters cell signaling to improve the communication between your cells so you function, think, and feel better. Okay, let's get back to this. Glycemic index, we talked about how eating certain sugars or eating certain carbohydrates in a fasting state, normally the dose is 50 grams, increases your blood sugar level. And the rate at which it increases, it puts you in one of three categories, either high glycemic foods, which are measured by you being in the 120 to 160. And you, for most of you, you know, that's a very high blood sugar level. And then the intermediate uh, or the moderate uh, glycemic foods put you in the 80 to 100 and then zero there's no such thing as zero, but they go from zero to 50, 79, excuse me, zero to 79 puts you in the category known as the hypoglycemic category. Now, that's not a good state either, because in that state, you're going to have decreased energy and decreased muscle wasting or, or catabolism of, of your muscle tissue to, to supply the body with protein. So you never want to be in that state. Things that are not good happen in the hypoglycemic state. Now, you don't want to be in the high state either. Now, here's what we used to do. This was old school bodybuilding and powerlifting thinking. We're going to take all kinds of sugar after our workouts so we get an amazing insulin response. Why? Because insulin takes in not only glucose, but amino acids. And it helps also with the shuttling in of vitamins, nutrients, and other critical key components that help the cells work better to recover after workouts. So what we realized with that was we were all getting really fat. <laughs> I was somebody that could never gain weight. I could lose weight easily, but I could never gain weight. So I was told many, many years ago in the 19, early 1980s, Nelson started eating 10,000 calories a day, no less than eight, and make sure you get plenty of sugar in there. Well, here's what happens with that. Let's go through the biochemistry and the endocrinology. You eat lots of sugar, you get a dramatic spike in the hormone insulin. So yes, I added a huge amount of muscle mass, but I also acquired an enormous amount of fat. Not fun. Didn't, didn't look good on me. Fat wasn't a good look. I had gone from an extremely lean, shredded body to a, <laughs> to a guy with a big belly all of a sudden. And I thought, why did I do this again? Now, interestingly, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make a joke of this, the guy who told me this ended up committing suicide. I'm not sure if there was a link or not with how he lived and how he ate. But I remember never forgetting, like, well, he wasn't too happy. And uh, he removed himself from the world, sadly, because he was a good guy. But once again, the key is to eat so your mind and your body, physiologically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, are balanced. Now, what you want to strive for is the intermediate zone called the anabolic zone. And the anabolic zone is very important because when you're in that zone, you get there by doing the following things. Let's take you to the gym now near the end of your workout. You're depleted. Let's go through the hormone cascade. When insulin is low, the body produces the hormone glucagon. Come on, guys, pay attention with me. This is good stuff. After the end of your workout, particularly the more intense your workout where you're depleted, the body produces from the pancreas glucagon. Glucagon causes the release of essential fatty acids like triglycerides. You, I know some of you were thinking sugar, but it doesn't. Your sugar levels now at the end of your workout are what? Quiz time. Come on, answer me. They're depleted. Your blood sugar levels are depleted. Your glycogen stores are all used up. Remember, glycogen is that macromolecule, that large assembly of glucose molecules. And as your body needs them to form cellular energy, it just keeps peeling off glucose molecule after glucose molecule after glucose molecule. Well, eventually the gas tank, right? If we're thinking about using the example of our car or our truck, we run out of gas. So eventually when you train hard, you run out of glucose. And so when that hormone glucagon is produced by the alpha cells in the pancreas, it causes the release of fatty acids. Now what are you doing? You're shrinking your fat cells by burning through oxidation fat molecules stored in your fat cells. So the amount of fat acquired by the body is getting smaller. Now, when insulin is low, growth hormone may elevate. Now, there are certain exercises, deadlifts and squats are, are wonderful. I was going to say playfully notorious, but that's the wrong word, are known famously 
for increasing growth hormone. So you deplete, I'm going to go through this a few different ways. You deplete your storage of glycogen, which means you run out of blood sugar, glucagon in the presence of low insulin does what? Releases the fatty acid. The body burns the fatty acid and you have an increase in growth hormone potentially if you're training intensely, particularly with large compound movements. Definitely we know deadlifting and squatting. So you get a surge of growth hormone. What does it do? Lipolysis, which means it burns up fat and increases growth hormone. Does what? It increases muscle mass. Now, some of you, particularly women out there, now I don't want to get muscly. Let me tell you something. You sure do want to get muscly because what happens after about the age of 40, 45, if you're not exercising intensely through some kind of weight resistance or body resistance activity, you can be losing an enormous amount if your hormones drop like a rock as you, as you go through andropause or menopause. Some people lose half a pound to multiple pounds a year, a year. So gaining muscle mass for most people is not easy. Why? Because they don't eat right, they don't sleep right, and they don't train intensely enough to acquire muscle mass. It is very important. Those who are the strongest often do the best. Now, it's not just about being strong. you got to have a sharp mind, too. But lots of wonderful things happen when you train hard. Now, here's the bad side of training hard. Anytime you're under lots of physical duress, intense workouts, or emotional stress, what hormone is produced? Did you say cortisol? If you did, you're right. Cortisol. Now, in a moment, I'm going to share with you some supplements that will dramatically help lower cortisol. Cortisol is important. Don't get me wrong. you got to have some cortisol. I talk to people, no, I want to eliminate cortisol. No, you don't. Cortisol is what helps you handle stress. If you don't produce any more cortisol, and I know this because when I had cancer, I produced almost no cortisol. I couldn't hear a gunshot go off in a movie without it sending my heart into arrhythmias. I literally could not watch violent shows because my cortisol was so low. Cortisol helps you adapt to stress moment by moment by moment. Right? So it's very, very important. It does a cascade of things that protect you against stress. It prepares you to flee if you're being chased by that saber-toothed tiger or that uh, short-nosed bear that might have been 14 feet tall. I've seen replicas of those things. I can't imagine living in a world. Saber-toothed tigers were, tigers were puny. They were seven to, to nine feet in length. But short-nosed bear, frightening. I mean, they're three or four times as, uh, the, the height of me. Very, very scary thought. You know, if you can go after a mastodon, this, this is terrifying, right? Not that the mastodon wasn't stronger, but an apex predator like the kind of bear I'm describing could take down in some cases a, a mastodon. Think about that for a moment. So when you're real quickly, let me sum this up because then I want to go into some other things. When you sum this up, you get through with your workout, you go to low, low to moderate We're going to talk about this when I get back, what this looks like. Glycemic foods. Why? Because you do want to get an insulin surge. You just don't want a crazy insulin surge. You don't want the insulin surge of a diabetic. You want to be in that 80 to 120 milligrams for the magical hour, the anabolic hour after your workout. And this is so important because insulin, remember, it's anabolic. It increases muscle mass. How? By shuttling in glucose, amino acids, vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients to help with recovery after the workout. So this is where some of the other diets, I think, fail. Carnivore, keto, veganism, uh, they, you're, you're getting, okay, you, you know, you're not getting the right amount of sugar to create the right insulin response. You're getting too much or too little. When you get just the right amount, you increase the magic too. Muscle acquisition and fat burning. Very important. In addition to that, you dramatically improve recovery. And you want to do that the first 60 minutes after your workout. We'll be right back. Take our last commercial break. I'm Dr. Nelson Bullmash, and you're listening to Health Matters. Safety Air Purification Systems, an air purifier with robust technologies that can filter, sterilize, and re-energize large quantities of air at a whisper quiet volume. 
It features a proprietary HEPA RX and pre filter that act as a capturing layer, going for big particles and ultra fine particles. Its next layer is an activated carbon filter that absorbs and captures volatile organic compounds and noxious odors. From viruses to bacteria, its kill chamber packs a three punch layer to destroy over 99% of anything that remains in the air. And while most air purifiers stop at the capture or kill stage, Safety Air Purifier takes it one step further, re-energizing clean, pure, sterilized air by creating negative ions within the revitalizing chamber. The Safety Air Purifier also monitors air quality in real time, utilizing smart sensor technology that helps you breathe better air, increase productivity, and improve morale. But don't just take our word for it. Ask the thousands of workplaces we've helped. Fortune 500 companies, dental offices, senior facilities, K-12 schools and universities, and professional sports teams. The Safety Air Purifier's robust technology combined to protect you against indoor air pollutants and viruses to make the most powerful yet quietest air purifier. Safety Air Purification. All right, folks, the weakness of today's show is I just don't have time to go into all the details. Here's what I mean by this. I know some of you are so smart and you're thinking, Nelson, you got to help us out. What kind of foods can we eat that fall into the anabolic zone that gently promote an increase of mild to moderate insulin surge and not put us in a hypoglycemic state? which is going to strip us of our muscle, inhibit our ability to recuperate after a week out and leave us tired, depleted, anxious, and mood disoriented or unstable. I will. I'm going to give you an idea. Now, once again, this, folks, here's the thing. This isn't the information that's hard. This is why I'm not covering this in great detail, but I'm going to give you some ideas right now. But remember, there's so much information out there about glycemic index and and what foods fall into which categories. I'm giving you the principles. You can look up. You can Google in 20 seconds the foods that are low to moderate glycemic index foods. So don't don't send me any hate mail about me not including a lot of information here. But I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a hand up here. So for example, couscous, oats, brown rice, even white rice that's cooked, high quality white rice. Not a big fan of pastas or wheat bread, but if you get high quality, you know, get organic, so it's not sprayed with glyphosate. All of these can be used as as grains, and they all will keep you in the uh, mild to moderate glycemic food index. Also, vegetables, you've got even potatoes, particularly with butter, sweet potatoes, white potatoes, Japanese potatoes, purple potatoes, Uh, fruits, you have apples, bananas. I know some of you are thinking bananas, really? Yes. Blueberries, cantaloupe, grapefruit, oranges, and we're talking whole oranges, not orange juice. That's very high glycemic. And uh, pears with skin, raspberries, strawberries. These are all foods that will get you in the low to moderate category, right? And you can find, I'm not going to give you all the portions. That's, once again, it's just easy to find. I've found it very, very easily. So look up glycemic foods. For example, if you're going to have oats for you bigger guys, I do one and a half cups. If you're 150, 200 pounds, I'd go one to one and a half, two cups of oatmeal after your workouts. If you're a smaller person, maybe under 100, 100-ish pounds, do a cup, for example. And that's consistent with all the grains I gave. For the sweet potatoes, we're talking about mostly medium. If you're under 200 pounds, if you're over 200 pounds like me, I'd go a larger sweet potato, a Japanese potato, white potato. You're going to need more carbs. You're going to need more carbs to form what? Glycogen. If you set it, you're right. And then fruit, you're looking at mostly a cup of all the fruits. You're fine. So that gives you an idea. You can do a little research. If you complain a lot, I'll do more on that. But I'm, it's, it's just so easy to find on the internet. Look up glycemic foods, and they'll give you all you need to know about that. But that gives that gets you in the game. Now remember, glycemic uh, foods do the following. If they're low glycemic, it means smaller rise in blood glucose levels after meals. It means that you have less fat acquisition because sugar stimulates insulin, and insulin is anabolic. So you're not just going to gain muscle, you're going to gain fat. This is where the rub comes. You don't want to be that person that you got a huge amount of muscle mass, but you got a lot of fat, right? So it, it also improves the relationship of glucagon to insulin, and that's very important because... 
the better that relationship is between glucagon. Remember, glucagon is produced also in the pancreas like insulin, and glucagon causes you to burn essential fatty, not essential, excuse me, fatty acids like triglycerides as energy. So you really want a, a nice balance between insulin and glucagon. Now, there's some other points I want to talk about too. Here's the thing. Once again, high sugar devastates you from an immunological perspective to a physiological perspective. Sugar drives oxidation. Remember I talked about ages? Remember that concept? Advanced glycation end products? When those, when those free radicals bind to your cell membranes, your fats and your proteins, they destroy them. The cell membrane is irrevocably destroyed. If it happens in your eye, you go blind. If it happens in your brain, you end up with dementia, right? So anytime you form these ages by having ridiculously high amounts of sugar, and many of you do, don't you look at me like that. I talk to many of you who eat way, way too much high glycemic sugars, right? You want to cut that out. You're going to destroy yourself, right? So somebody's calling me here, goodness gracious. Um, how do I stop this? I can't believe we go. Sorry about that. So the key is to consume low to moderate glycemic foods. When you talk about fruits, you're talking about eating about a cup. Now, uh, let me be very clear with you. I'm being generic here. I'm talking about for most meals. I have taught you this. And if you haven't heard it because you've just, you're new to my show, welcome and thank you for joining me. Remember this. When do you need a third to 50% of your calories? After you've done a workout. And that first hour is magical. That anabolic hour, as they call it. Re and really, it's the first 45 minutes. You want to make sure you're getting a good fruit source in. Uh, I, I love fruit because you get a little quicker hit from an insulin perspective, which means you drive in glucose, you drive in um, proteins, amino acids, and you drive in other nutrients. So th this is you really want to take advantage of that. It, it always shocks me when I say to somebody, well, what, what's your immediate after workout meal? And they say, well, I don't, I don't eat after a workout. Well, when do you eat? You know, like four hours later. <sighs> Shocking because you're losing, number one, you're keeping yourself maintained in a very catabolic, catabolic means breakdown state. You want to live in an anabolic state as long as you can. So if you work out hard for an hour and a day, you want pretty much the 23 hours outside of that, that intense workout state or that workout state to be anabolic, muscle building, recovery state. You do not want to be, uh, you know, lingering for any period of time uh, in a catabolic state. You know, they say, don't dance with the devil. Don't dance staying in a catabolic state for long because that's a breakdown state. That means your body is being broken down. You know, I have people who say to me, they don't eat anything before workout. I'm not a fan of that. I just haven't seen great things. What I mean by that is I've seen too many people who had lose way too much muscle mass in a moment here, I'm going to go into something that I really like, okay? And just hang in there with me. I'm going to talk about the supplements, the magical six supplements that, that or I won't say supplements because some of these you can even find all together in one supplement, but amino acids that are critical to driving anabolism. There's a cool word, anabolism, meaning recovery and build up, particularly of muscle mass. Remember, don't, don't ever waste your time lecturing to me about you don't want muscle. That's a silly thing to say. That's an uneducated thing to say. Muscle is very hard to acquire for a lot of people. And I'm giving you secrets to help you build more muscle. You want to be that person who goes from, muscularly into your later years. Why? Because you're going to function better. You don't want to be that person who's topsy-turvy and you fall down, you break a hip because you're so fragile and then you're dead in a year, or year and a half. I remember reading a stat that 70% of the people after they break their hip in their 70s or 80s die within a, a year or so. That's an insane statistic because it's avoidable in most cases. You work out hard. You create a more bony matrix, means you're more functional, more dynamic. You can handle stress better. When my father died and they were looking at him post-death, they said, your dad had the body minus the destruction of the diabetes, but his, his skeletal system was like that of a 20-year-old. Yeah, he worked out his entire life. That's what happens. That's the benefit. So real quickly, a couple stats you want to know. One of the things people ask me constantly, Nelson, how much protein should I have every day? I'm going to give you a number that's different than what most people say. Most of the pioneers that are out there today say you don't need this much protein. This is the amount of protein that all of the higher level athletes 
that I have trained and the people I know who have trained at a higher level all take if they're into strength and bodybuilding. Now, if you're a long distance runner, you don't need this much. You might use half to three quarters of the amount I'm going to give you. That statistic, my favorite range is one gram to one and a half grams of protein per pound of body weight. Let me say that again. One to one and a half grams of protein per pound of body weight. So in other words, a 200 pound man is going to need 200 to 300 grams of protein a day. Now, there are lots of people out there who are going to say, Nelson, why are you telling people that? That's insane. That's very hard on your liver and kidneys. Let me tell you something. I have heard that for decades. If you have research that proves that, did you hear what I said? Proves that, you show it to me. Because I've been to a whole lot of functional events where really sharp functional doctors who also are really intense workout enthusiasts say there is no credible research that indicates that you destroy your liver and your kidneys by eating higher amounts of protein. Now, if you're having kidney problems, liver problems, then increased protein might be a problem because you're making your liver and kidneys work harder. Okay, different story now, right? We've got to create perspective here. If you're a healthy person and you're eating clean proteins, I'm not talking about feedlot beef. I'm talking about grass-fed beef. I'm talking about wild-caught salmon, sardines, anchovies, even, you know, white fish, various types of white fish in clean waters. If you're hunting on clean land in Alaska or uh, the Canadian north, northeast or northwest, if you're Montana, Wyoming, or you're living in a state where you're, you know that the area you're living in is particularly clean, you know, you don't have a lot of uh, heavy chemicals like Atlanta, where we have extremely high levels of, of toxicity through pollution, then you can eat these animals. So let me go through these amino acids, and I've got to do it briefly. Uh, if you have more questions, I can talk to you later. The first is beta alanine. Beta alanine is unbelievable because it counters the effects of lactic acid. It's, it's so crazy. I've had people take 30 seconds off an 800 meter time because of that. Another one is glutamine, and I'm going to go through this a little quickly. Glutamine is incredible because it is the most abundant amino acid in the skeletal system. It is also depleted through gluconeogenesis along with branched chain amino acids when you're working out hard. So when your blood sugar level gets low, the body starts taking these amino acids, glutamine, valine, leucine, isoleucine, and converting them through gluconeogenesis in the liver to sugar. Now, you don't get a lot of, you don't get a lot of glycogen production or sugar production if this is the way you're getting going to form glucose. This is why it's important to have 45%, at least 42% of your calories from low to moderate glycemic index foods. That's why, because you get much more uh, quick recovery and you can train longer with more endurance and more intensity if you get not only enough glycogen stored up, but you have these amino acids, beta alanine, glutamine, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. These are very, very important. Glutamine does so many things. It helps produce one of the most powerful antioxidants in the body, glutathione. So it's a precursor required to make the antioxidant glutathione. It's a precursor to make growth hormone. Uh, I can go on and on and on. So its properties are incredible. I love to get four to five grams of a combination of glutamine, isoleucine, and valine in a powder and I take it an hour before my workout. I'm a fan not of taking it after the workout. I'm a fan of having access to it before my workout. That way, when I'm, my glycogen stores are depleted, I get to go into gluconeogenesis, but I give my body the amino acids to burn. The last one is arginine. Arginine is used for all kinds of things as well. One of the things it's used for is to help with um, uh, as an antioxidant, but it's also used to help make nitric oxide. And I've gone into that in more detail, critical, because that determines the elasticity, the quality of your circulatory system. When you get low in nitric oxide, you can't control the diameter of the blood vessels, and therefore you get an alteration in fluid dynamics and your ability to give blood when you need it, where you need it. All right, I'm wrapping up. I'll be back here in two weeks. I hope you enjoyed my show. If you did, share it with the world. Help me get this information out there. 
I love doing what I do. I am Dr. Nelson Bullmash, and this is Health Matters. I will see you back in two weeks, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Health Matters with Dr. Nelson Bullmash, where we help you discover how to ignite your mind, body, and spirit connection. Join us next time when we will bring you more exciting guests and engaging topics. Meanwhile, feed your mind, exercise your body, and nurture your spirit. The United Intentions Foundation and its associates take no responsibility for the opinions and statements made by the talk show hosts or their guests.